agenda? Not from me. Not from Bruce. Or John. Nothing from you, John? Nope. <laughs> Nothing from me, no. Oh, OK. Nope. <clears throat> Sounds good. Um, so let's review the minutes from February 14th. I move to approve the minutes of February 14th. Um, can we discuss them? I have a proposed change or, um, yeah. <laughs> um, in, on page four in the discussion of the um, shade tree preservation plan, um, um, the first sentence on the top of page four is kind of a summary. Uh, board members were generally receptive to the plan with no substantive revisions proposed other than the, and then the rest of the sentence. And then there's some kind of commentary for the next several sentences until the end. I would propose we delete that um, because there's going to be a public hearing on the plan and folks um, can ask questions and elicit responses from the drafters of the plan. I'm not sure if kind of the commentary is appropriate and I don't, I don't recall um, specifically that historical discussion. Um, so that would be my recommendation that we end the um, sentence and paragraph after um, the word convey after the first three lines. Yeah, thanks, thanks for bringing that up. I, I was um, stopping short when I read through that too. And I, I figure I don't remember that happening, but I guess I must have just spaced out for that part of the meeting. But uh, <laughs> uh, I, in my I defense, it did happen, Carl. <laughs> it, did, it did happen because actually I brought it up. Okay. So this is what I had brought up because I'm confused a little bit about this the rights of the trees on the side of the road. And I understood the balance had swung more to the landowner. So that's why I brought that up. And this does capture that discussion that we've had. Um, so I'm for leaving it in myself, but I, I just, um, I know there's a gray area and that's kind of what I brought up at the meeting. That when we talked about the trees, I was like, how's that working now? I understood there was some problems with it. Blah, blah, blah. Well, then maybe there was discussion about the evolution of the statute as opposed to there's long been a troublesome legal gray area. Um, I think, I don't know, I, I don't think, know that that's accurate. Um, it, and, is. <laughs> it is. We've had problems with this tree thing in the, in the town right away. Yeah, that, uh, the, the phrase troublesome legal gray area is commentary that um, I don't know that we as a board articulated. I think Seth, you raised the question regarding whether the plan is in contravention of the statute. And I discussed how the plan was mm -hmm. actually anticipated in the statute and the statute provided a mechanism for creation yep. of the plan and the powers in the plan. But yep. how it's described, um, I think is more, um, it, it's more commentary that um, kind of is, I, I, I'm, I'm struggling with the right term. Um, but so I, because there's going to be a hearing on it, um, I don't know that I would want um, the residents of the town to read this and think that the select board um, is believes has this opinion, which I, I don't I, I, I don't know if that's the case. I know I don't, but I I would recommend that we delete from convey to the end. I, I, you know, I think that uh, you could attribute that statement to Seth if you wanted to, and I don't think Seth would have a problem with that, and then it wouldn't be the board who made the statement, and I do think people have a right to know what we say at these meetings, they don't need to know word for word, but that general discussion did come up, and it was Seth who, who, who brought it up, so to say Seth? 
Yeah, it sounds good to me. Such and such and, and assign it to him. And then it's not the board. We don't have a problem with it. And okay, I do so think that- we have a right to talk about stuff like that, even if there's going to be a hearing coming up, because it's not like we're doing something ex parte. We're, do- we're, we're doing our, the job we're supposed to be doing is select board members. Okay, so the sentence um, chair, Gartner, um, relate or whatever, um, I would just, you know, maybe attribute it in the beginning for that sentence. The next mm-hmm. sentence, discussion on this topic revealed that although the plan sets out the town's protocol for handling trees in road right of ways, complete clarity on the respective legal rights held by the town and effective landowners remains somewhat elusive. Um, is that all attributed to Seth? I don't mind. <laughs> Because, because he's a landowner, and I'm sure he, this, the reason this came up is because he's experienced this elusiveness. Yeah, oh, yeah but, but, but that sentence is attributed to, the, that sentence describes the yeah. plan itself as opposed to the historical mm-hmm. ambiguity. And I don't know that we dove deep enough into the plan to see whether it clarified that um, what Seth identified as what Seth called or characterized as an ambiguity. No, the final sentence there, it appears clear, however, et cetera, that I recall everybody say, uh, looking at it in the end and saying, yes, this is this is true after some discussion. Yeah. Or at least no one objected to that. Right. So the sentence, so we're keeping the one aspect sentence, attributing it to Seth, yeah. Mm-hmm. The second sentence, however, though, um, I, I don't recall us evaluating the plan itself to determine whether or how it resolved the gray area that Seth was concerned about. Mm-hmm. Well, I thought that we had concluded that the, that the plan does set out the town's protocol for handing trees right away. Which is the last sentence. I agree. I would agree to keeping that in. I think that's yeah, yeah. fine. You're talking about the second sentence. Yeah, the discussion on this topic revealed that although the plan sets out the town's protocol for handling trees in the road rights of way, complete clarity on the respective legal rights held by the town and effective landowners remains somewhat elusive. I don't know that we, um, that whether or I don't believe that was discussed because I don't think we got into the weeds of the plan because we are having the upcoming hearing. And so I, I, I'm going to defend myself one more time. I yeah. agree 100% that this is not the words of Seth. This is a generalized uh, synopsis of what was discussed. That right. middle sentence gets to the fact that there are still questions whether the shade tree is determined to be, excuse me, whether the tree is determined to be a shade tree and hence covered uh, by the the new statutes or whether it is not covered that way, there is still question as to who can cut the silly thing. And once it's cut, who can do what with what's left? I don't believe... We had that conversation about the plant, is what I'm saying. Seth identified his historical concern. Um, This may be an afterthought kind of conclusion that I don't believe we had at the meeting. Okay, so I remember specifically asking what the plan was going to do as far as trees go. And I said, if you're going to designate an area that has shade trees along the road, and that's a designated area. That means that we can't cut those trees. And then, and then I said, are you going to have every road designated as sh- every tree along every road designated shade trees, or are we going to go just certain areas of shade trees? And that's exactly what I was asking. And so then this is what came out of that. Plan sets out the town's protocol for handling trees and roads right away, and that's what we talked about. We didn't really come to a clear conclusion at the end of the discussion. Did they say they were going to do a map or something? Right. We said, yeah. and they said they were going to. And I said, what if, are you going to do a map? Are you going to designate certain roads with certain trees as shade trees? And then those trees we can't cut. And then what about the rest of the trees on the rest of the roads? 
who has the right to cut those trees? So this is this is those are my questions, and I thought that this captured that confusion. So we did talk about it as as it relates to the plan. Uh, but absolutely. the conclu the conclusory sentence complete clarity on the respective legal rights held by the town and effective landowners remains somewhat elusive right. that's placing a conclusion on the adequacy of the plan and that it does not clarify or provide folks with notice on what their rights are and whether or what trees can be cut down, which I think can be addressed and will be addressed at the hearing. I think having the um, editorializing that it remains somewhat elusive extends beyond the scope of our discussion and any conclusions reached at the hearing, at our okay. select board meeting. So for the sake of moving on, may I suggest that we attribute one aspect of roadside tree management, that sentence to Seth. Yep. We eliminate the second sentence of the discussion on this topic because it adds nothing to the previous sentence and then uh, leave it appears clear, however, as is. Okay. I mean, we can do that though. We did have the discussion. I think that's what we came up with, but if that's offensive to certain people, we can just leave it out move on you know it isn't that important i i i just want to clarify i'm not saying it's offensive i'm saying we did not there wasn't a conclusion reached that um encompassed the language in that sentence so well that that seemed to be the answer that i got in answer to my question was that we weren't clear on the legal rights by landowners or the town we weren't clear where the line was drawn on that, but you know, if you're feeling that this is something that's not appropriate, even though it is what we talked about, it does hint, it does capture that. It's, if it's going to keep us from moving on, we can just eliminate that, it. That that sense is captured in the first sentence about long been a troublesome yeah. has long sure. been a troublesome that's, legal that's, gray area. Yeah, I mean it's okay. We can we can move on, leave it out. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Okay. So Bruce, did you get that? I got it. All right. Thank you. Okay. So my, my motion is to approve the minutes as amended. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Do we have a second on those? A second. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. Got through that. Um, the next public comment. We have public here, I see, but um, nobody's commenting. Okay, so let's move on to access permits. And we have the 22 005 Rich Atkin Curb Cup for 2021 Cummings Farm Subdivision Lot 1. Has everyone looked that over? There and let me just look at that. Has everyone looked at that access permit? Yeah. Yeah. How's it look? Looks okay to me, and it's a road yeah, I drive I mean, a lot. Okay. Got three signed off on it. Yeah, okay. that's the most important thing to me. <clears throat> yeah, I don't have it in front of me, but I've got the um, application. I don't have a map. So if look I behind the application, yeah. Seth, it's right there. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I got the application. It must be the map from the back. Oh, no. Okay. It's just behind it. <laughs> behind it? Oh. You've got the whole file in front of you. Yeah, okay. I don't see it. It must have got mixed in with something else. But it's okay. <laughs> We're good. <laughs> Ah. All right, do we have a motion to approve the access permit or the curb cut? Sure. Oh, I know where it is. It's in the, uh, it's in the whole second. Uh, um, any further discussion? 
Okay, I'm looking at it. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 The ayes have it. Thank you. Um, okay, the next thing we have is consideration of liquor license applications. And we have Fox Market and Plainfield Hardware. And they're right here. Has anyone had a chance to look them over? So the Fox Market one is screwy. The Fox yeah. Market, the first two pages look more or less as I expect them to. But then uh, the third page has Plainfield Hardware typed in, but Donnie at foxmarket.store is the email address. So I don't know what's going on. And it looks like it's probably Donnie's signature on the fourth page, the second page of that one. So I don't know what's going on there. Okay, so. Okay, the one on, uh, that's the third one. So the fourth one, this is Plainfield Hardware. Hmm. And that's Fox Market, right. Does he work there? I mean, Donnie is one of the owners of Fox Market. He has no, no I'm connection. In a Plainfield Hardware. Yeah, yeah. I, it's just weird. Yeah. It says, please include email address. It says Donnie at Fox Market. Yeah. And then the okay. signature on page two of that one looks sort of like it might be Donnie's. On the back page? Oh, I'm looking at it. Yeah, I'm not sure. And then I don't know what those numbers are, the upper right hand corner, but the 6195001, that's different from the 10378002, which has Fox Market typed in. 6195001 is the one for the full Plainfield <laughs> hardware one. Yeah. Yeah, that's a different application. Yeah. It's like they all got morphed together in some kind of strange yeah. hybrid of so, liquor licenses. So, Bruce, is that a mistake or what is that? Damn if I know, Seth. So uh, these include email address, but the doing business is playing for hardware. So, we're thinking <laughs> Donnie at Fox Market is not the correct email for Plainfield Hardware. <laughs> That's not the, I mean, the Plainfield Hardware one is a separate document. This is a, this was meant to be the Fox Market one. But clearly, he wasn't working on a clean slate here. So the Fox Market, they're looking for a, both a first and a second class license? Yes. It, when they went into business last April, you approved the first class, the outside consumption, and the second class. Mm -hmm. And that's they're getting renewals for those three. But obviously, the second class one, as Carl rightly points out, there's a mess up here. Yeah. So it would be helpful if you would approve the concept, if you're okay with it, and we'll get him to get his own clean. Yeah, this is something the clerk signs off on, correct? This is something you sign off on yeah. and the clerk certifies. Okay. This isn't like one of those event. It's not. Deals. Okay. Yeah. So and Plainfield Hardware, only thing wrong with it is the email address or it's the signature on the back also, right? No. For, so I'm working with what was up on the website, Seth. And for yeah. Plainfield Hardware, there's only two pages for yeah. a second class license. Uh, and the upper right hand corner of each of them says 6195001. They look right. Yeah. And they, they look okay. So, so can we approve that one? Sure. sure. <laughs> what what I was saying is, if you're okay with con this conceptually, approve them all. Yeah. And then we will get his. I don't know where he has to go to get the that form corrected. Uh huh. But we will work with him to get it corrected because he clearly thought it was the one he was supposed to be working on. Right. Because that's all his stuff in there. Right. As far as the handwritten stuff. Yeah. So we aren't approving these forms as filled out. We're approving the concept of licenses right. for these right. entities. Yeah. Right. Do we need separate motions for one for each entity? I would. Yes. Okay. What, yeah. One for each entity. Yeah. Yeah. The three permits on the one. Right. 
Um, yeah, I agree with um, doing separate and starting off with Plainfield. Um, okay, are you making that motion? Yes. In which case, I I'm seconding it. <laughs> Doing this, I'm moving to approve the um, liquor license for Plainfield hardware. Yes. Yep. I got that. Okay. And that's 6195001 FCCN 001. Correct. Yep. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. We've got that one done. And then we're going to move to Fox Market. And they are applying for, is that three different? Licenses, liquor licenses, one, two, three. Now, one, two, and outside consumption. Okay. Um, could we could we separate this one out into the first and the second class? Because I, I I don't feel comfortable approving the second class because the description of premises is inaccurate as well. Um, and I I, I it, we have the authority to approve the application, and we don't have a complete application in front of us. Um, so I, I think we should look first to the first, the first class and recommend, you know, he submit um, his second class. I, I have a different suggestion. Um, I, I, I um, would like to approve the renewal of the liquor licenses for Fox Market under the same conditions as last year, subject to uh, complete and accurate applications being made. And we have to sign those anyway. Yeah. The application. You don't have to individually sign them. Oh, you don't? You only have to sign on behalf. That, that was one of those COVID deals uh, where Seth, basically last year you approved me because it was one of the meetings that Seth was in Florida. Mm -hmm. But this time you'd be approving Seth to sign him. Oh. Okay. So I support Carl. Is that a motion, Carl? Yes. Okay. I second that. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. Good. Did not, in that motion, did we talk about me signing the thing since I'm here? Yes. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Okay. That's done. Um, the next thing is the mask mandate uh, discussion on town management in light of COVID-19. Um, I asked Bruce to put this on because I've had so many phone calls asking us to repeal the mask mandate. Um, I understand that we need to discuss that. So that's why I brought it up. Um, I get calls every day right now. So I don't know if other um, select board members have had any feedback on the mask mandate. I'd be curious to know. And also, I think that maybe some people are going to call in tonight. I see a lot of names up here. So I'd like to kick that off, that discussion. And here we go. I see Carl. Carl? Yeah, I haven't had any calls about the mask mandate. I have noted, as Bruce mentioned in the uh, select board memo, that even when the CDC came out with a new measure of, uh, of community transmission and mask, uh, when mask guidelines uh, might apply and uh, turned a whole huge swath of the country that had been red into green or yellow, uh, meaning they had enough space in their hospitals for uh, people to get sick and, and to go in there with COVID, uh, that Washington County and uh, several adjoining counties uh, still remain red in the highest uh, highest risk zone. So that indicates to me that even with uh, relaxing standards from CDC, we're still in a, a time that um, keeping the mask mandate could uh, could help you know, save some some lives or save some people from getting sick. Um, I see Kim has got a hand up. She she zoomed in. So Kim, you got the floor. Um, yeah, I. I wanted to just, I'm more focused on the businesses in, Mont, in East Montpelier, not about national, um, you know, causes and things like that, because Montpelier is looking to drop theirs on March 11th. And I think um, that it's probably time that the businesses not get burdened and to go back to having their signs that clearly state, if you're vaccinated, you don't have to wear a mask. And if you aren't, then you do have to wear a mask because you come into their 
premises because we're putting them in a position where they're supposed have to police people and things like that. And I also want to encourage um, supporting vaccines. And by saying that, you know, you don't have to be burdened with wearing a mask if you're vaccinated. And I think if you speak to the hospitals in the region, they are not at capacity. They have plenty of room for, um, for people who are unvaccinated and may get COVID. Um, so I, I have to go pick up somebody at the train station. So I don't, I can't stay on, but I just wanted to voice that opinion because I've had several people stop me in Dudley's, stop me in the home center and say, please, please work with the select board to help lift the mandate for mass. And I tried to get them to call in, but the apathy is too great in the town right now. <laughs> <laughs> but they're, they're a little bit intimidated by, you know, having to call in for me. Because we're talking about people that don't usually speak out publicly in meetings. You know, ordinary people that have jobs are not usually present at these meetings. So we're trying to represent a broad um, constituent here. And um, that's why I brought it up. Because the people feel comfortable about calling me at the farm. And they feel comfortable about calling me on the street. But these aren't the kind of people that you usually call in the meeting. So this is why I'm bringing it up because I want to. Yeah, I, I've now, been stopped three or four times in yeah. Dudley's to say, please help yeah. us, you know, lift this yeah. mandate, um, and yeah. so that we do not have to, to, to keep, you know, talking to people or, or let's just say they're apathetic and they're not doing it anymore. They don't care. These people come in for their, they come in the store to buy something and it maybe takes them five to 10 minutes to get it and they're out. And the, if they forgot their mask, they still wait on them. Yeah, they still wait yeah. on them, but it puts them in a tough position. Okay. So so I'd, I'd like to clarify what's happening in Montpelier. Uh, the Montpelier city manager's report said the city council voted on February 9th to extend the mask mandate. They will take this up again for discussion at their March 9th meeting. The current expiration date of the mandate is March 11th. That's just following the protocol that we're required to follow from the state that you have to renew the mandate every 30 days. There's nothing in there indicating that they're going to drop it on their March I, 9th meeting. I, I do, I'm sorry, I should have prefaced that. I do know that they have strong from uh, the business owners and alive to try and go back to the original sign that says unvaccinated, you you wear a mask if you wanna come in, vaccinated, you don't have to. Yeah. Okay. Bye, sorry. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks for coming, Kim. Thanks. So anybody else on the site board have anything to say or anybody I see other people, okay, Amy? I just I think that masks are very quickly in other places becoming completely obsolete. I mean, I was just in Minnesota last week and they have about the same rates as we do and nobody was wearing a mask. Nobody. I mean, I think it's just a matter of time before this just all goes by the wayside. Um, there's only 35 people I think I heard today in the hospitals in yep. all of Vermont. Yep, that's right. I read the same thing. And we're also the comments that I'm hearing from health officials. Um, I've listened to some of them from the state that we're approaching herd immunity. They feel everyone, a lot of people have gotten COVID and also a lot of people are vaccinated. So this is where the masking is going to go away. It's just a question of time. And ordinary people are feeling frustrated because they feel that we're um, interfering with their lives in kind of an unwanted way. So that's the gist of what I've got from the people that have called me. The seven-day positivity rate is 4.9%. is down from 13.8% just in January. Yeah. Um, and the average case, is, case counts around 200 a day now. Um, and that's down 28% in the last seven days. And is down 44% in the last 14 days. So I, I feel um, I, I feel that we should eliminate it. We should not we should not extend it. Um, our, our little town's not going to make a huge impact on transferring COVID anyway. Um, 
uh, and I know Burlington's talking about doing away with it. There's all kinds of, of, of areas that stop, are not like Berlin never did that. And if you go up to Berlin and you go to the, to the uh, planet fitness, I was there the other day. There was only probably three people out of the whole crowd that was there that were wearing masks. Yeah. So. But I really, think, just, just to clarify though, um, John, is that this is the meeting where we would extend it. That right. It would have to be the next meeting. This right. is just, uh, I brought this up under my own violation, violation, violation. And I asked Bruce to put it on the agenda. But I asked Bruce to put it on the agenda just because I'd gotten so much um, feedback from town. town. Yeah, well, I... So we, we don't have to, we're not in the business tonight of extending it because it still right. would go until our next meeting. Right. I, I don't know if we could stop it now, which would be nice if we could. You can know. review it. I think that if you read the statute, the statute says as a minimum, you have to meet at, uh, at 30 day intervals, but there's nothing saying you can, can't meet sooner to eliminate. Right. right. So we, I think we, like you said, I think we could eliminate it at this meeting, uh, but we don't have to, we're not in the uh, business of having to extend it yet. Right. Right. Yes. Yes. Good. Yep. Uh, uh, thank you, Seth. Um, I appreciate the comments and I agree that, you know, the tide is beginning to turn. At our last meeting two weeks ago, we discussed extending um, the mask mandate at least until, or I, I, I know that I had a concern about extending it at least through town meeting because we were going to have a number of people coming into the school building and there may be people congregating in other places, just chatting, you know, more people in and around town than usual. Um, and the board agreed to extend it for another 30 days. Um, I think we should continue <clears throat> with that and take up this issue at our next meeting, which is it next Monday? Is our next meeting next Monday? Um, it, is, it is, yes. Yeah, either, you know, vote next Monday to cancel it or or not do anything which would mean after 30 days from two weeks ago it would expire on its own i think i would not recommend that we um um vote to remove it or eliminate it um today but i do appreciate and think that it's um we're approaching the time when we may be able to allow it to expire on its own or to revisit this at our next meeting. Okay, so just to clarify on the school issue, which is where the polls are, what Carl had said at that meeting was, we don't have jurisdiction at the school. Is that correct, Carl? Um, no. At the polling place. At the polling place, we don't have jurisdiction for math. Um, as, at the polling place, we cannot prevent people from voting. voting for not right. wearing a mask, but we can tell them that uh, they must you know, vote outside. And my understanding is that Rosie is, um, has made provisions for people to uh, mark their ballots outside the building. Okay, so, so I was wrong in saying that we don't have jurisdiction of the school, because I didn't think we did. Well, it's, my, my understanding is that it's not operating as a school, it's operating as a polling place, and we have jurisdiction over the polling place. Yeah, it's okay. a, yeah. Okay. Yeah, all right. Well, thank you for that clarification. Sorry, sure. I was, I thought that it was said differently, but I get it, I get it now. But we can't prevent people from voting one way or the other. Right. They can vote, yeah. Okay, so I see other names up here. Does anybody else have anything to say about the mask mandate? I see Ed. Gary Allen, Scott Hess, Edie, no, so there. Does all... Jenny have anything to say about the mask mandate? I see that she's on. Hi, Jenny. <laughs> yeah, I just unmuted. Um, I can tell you that um, there are a couple of really interesting things I learned about East Montpelier in, in this process. Um, one is that there is no list of merchants or businesses. It, it, there's no such thing. Um, so basically what I had to do um, was drive up and down the main roads and look for a store or a business with a sign outside and go knock on their door and uh, because there, there is no list. Um, and there could be hundreds of businesses that are in somebody's home 
that we don't have a list of and wouldn't know about. And so they didn't get a visit. But what was really heartening was how um, encouraging the business owners were. They were, there was no resistance. Nobody was unhappy to see me. Nobody told me to leave and not come back. They were, they were grateful. They quickly put their masks on when they saw me walk in the door with my little um, package of stuff. And, um, and several of them had their own version of something out already. And one person said, yeah, Bruce sent it to me and I printed it out because he already had one up by the time I got there. Um, so I didn't, I didn't see any resistance. I think that there's enough people who were grateful to have somebody authorizing them so they didn't have to be the quote unquote bad guy. And that's always a decent role for um, a civic organization to play is, you know, I'm, I'll, I'll take the heat so that you can look sympathetic to your customers, which is what you should be doing. Um, and I still don't know where all the businesses in East Montpelier are. Okay. Seth, Seth you asked for That's some more gone. comment. Yeah, yeah. I, I think we're, we're, we're basically outliers by now. And if I, cho if I choose to wear a mask, I'll wear a mask. Right. Um, but I think, I think the time has come as, as people have mentioned. You're exactly right. If you want to wear a mask, that's absolutely fine. The people in the businesses would appreciate that if people were allowed the choice and we're kind of at that point in the pandemic, pandemic, et cetera, et cetera, where it'll be by choice. The mask mandates are going away. But if I don't, I don't know what we have for support at this meeting to end it. Um, not sure where everyone's on this, Judith is recommending we don't do it. So I have the clear feeling from Judith that she doesn't want to act on this at this meeting. I don't know where everyone else is. Um, I would well, like to act on it, but myself. We could, we, could, we could act on it not after town meeting and do it next Monday. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd like to do that because you, know, okay. you, you brought Seth to the table, the, the people who've been calling you to ask to have it dropped. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. But when I've gone out in the past on Front Porch Forum and asked, we've gotten strong support for it. Uh, things may have changed. We, I, I think uh, we need to do some due diligence on this and give people a, a chance to know that uh, we are considering a change of policy. But, but I will say, Kyle, and I, I do appreciate your um, thorough um, researching from, the, from uh, Front Porch Forum or using Front Porch Forum as a platform. But I have to tell you that the ordinary person on the street is not going to come forth. They, they will call you or they will buttonhole you as they're going by. They'll talk to you in Dudley over a cup of coffee. They'll go to the home center, et cetera. But um, it is an aspect of the public that you're going to reach through Front Porch Forum, but you don't reach um, a lot of the working class people in town. Uh, mm -hmm. That's my perception. That's my perception. But I don't think it's that accurate. But it's fine. Sure. We put it off another week, and this is certainly. I'm I'm glad I brought it up. Yeah. Because it gives us warning. It gives us time to um, flesh it out a little bit further, and we can bring it up the next week. And I guess I would, you know, Seth, if folk come to you and feel comfortable approaching you, if you can try to encourage them to call in or participate at our meetings yeah. and share with them that will be receptive and we're right. looking for their input because we want to make decisions that represent what you know the residents and folks who live here want us to do we don't right. want to do it in a vacuum and, um, that's, and that's absolutely true Judith. and um and i did tell every single person that um called me or approached me and said we're having a meeting please call in but like i said they're shy about doing that um and i need to get phone numbers to them, the time of the meeting, the time when the agenda item comes up, et cetera, et cetera. They need to be coaxed along to speak in public. It's, it's, always, it's always an issue, especially with people that, um, you know, tend to be more working class people. They don't feel comfortable about some of, the, some of these public forums. So anyway, um, I think we can kick it along to next meeting. Sounds good. We've had a healthy discussion about it and I'm ready to move on. That sound good? Okay. Good. Okay, so um, we've got warrants. 
and that's a special expense one, and we also have a regular expense one. Um, is it, has everyone reviewed those warrants? Yeah, I make a motion if, if everybody's if everybody's ready to do that. Um, for the first one, um, it's the uh, what, what I don't even know what to term it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a special one, anyways, for $500 uh, to People's United Bank. Um, I would make, I recommend John, we approve it. John, I'm going to stop you. You don't need to make a motion. Okay. That, that one's for review only. Okay. Uh, you would authorize Seth to do special warrants when it's necessary. Okay. Yeah, I did that one. <laughs> That's yeah, probably one. why your name's on there. <laughs> but the minutes reflect that we have reviewed that one yeah thoroughly <laughs> reviewed it <laughs> the other one does require um a motion i believe to have these signed the regular one the regular expense one is february 28th and i looked through that one i didn't see anything that was strange or out of place mm -hmm. right it's not very much actually So you want to approve the, uh, have, have, we would do a motion to have Seth sign this one. Yeah. Which would be the uh, expense warrant from uh, 228.22 to two, well, 228.22. Yeah. <laughs> yes. We have that motion. Do we have a second? Second. Second. Okay. I'll give it a second. Judith, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 The ayes have it. Um, other business? We didn't have any. Um, we're three minutes early. Well, since we have three minutes and oh, Kimberly just showed up, but um, let, let me just throw this out there. Um, uh, ARPA funding, uh, Bruce gave us an, an email after the last meeting about um, gradual clarification around the rules for use of, of ARPA funding. I just want to um, put up on our attention, uh, something that we've talked about a little bit in the past, and that is uh, a, a process for getting town input on how to use that. So let's just not forget that. Yep. So, so Carl, I can give you a quick update for what it's worth on that topic. Judith had mentioned uh, doing this in April. Yeah. So what I've done is set up the April 4th meeting uh, to have this topic uh, brought up again and Bonnie Wanninger from regional planning will be there okay. to help us again like she tried to do last fall. And this topic will be how to get citizen input on spending the ARPA funds? It, it'll probably be described as a very general topic yeah. but yeah okay. hopefully okay. We're, we'll be talking about a lot of aspects. Yep very good. So in advance of that April 4th meeting, should we send out, you know, notice and signpost and front porch forum, um, letting people know that that will be the topic of discussion and we'll, we're beginning to look for input or is it this April 4th meeting, which is kind of the beginning of how we will determine the process for getting information. I just think it might be helpful having folks at the meeting where Bonnie is explaining what types of projects are eligible? That sounds good. Yeah. Or should we wait until we get some projects that we, I think that if we get some guidance first, then we can craft our, our advertisements or our public notices around that. Because if we do it willy nilly, we have no idea what we're doing. But I think it's just worth getting on people's radar that we have uh, a one-time infusion of Buku money, and uh, we're trying to figure out how to spend it to do the most good for the town. We're still trying to figure out the parameters of that, and uh, you know, April 4th will be uh, a discussion of it, because you got to tell people something seven times before it really registers. Not, not when it comes to giving away money. <laughs> to <them> seven times. <laughs> I'd rather just have more guidance before we advertise, but whatever. What do you think, Bruce? <laughs> this one's your guys' thoughts, not mine. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, if, so the way you want to do it, um, Carl, was you want to say we have bushel baskets uh, money giving away to town clerk's office? <laughs> and we don't know what the requirements are, but just come, come down. Come and get it. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can probably figure out some more elegant language than that. <laughs> We can be more specific. 
<laughs> okay. Um, we, we can talk about this next at our next meeting. Yeah. We have Kimberly Jessup with us at seven fifteen. I think we ought to hear her speak. So, Kimberly. You're on the floor. All right. Hi, everyone. So the, the bushel baskets of money. Gee, that sounds exactly <laughs> how we do it in a probe. <laughs> so um, I know we have a short time and you all have to get to another meeting. So I just thought if it's OK, I'll I'll give a brief overview of what I think might be of interest. And then if there are particular things you want to flag or have me run down, I'll do my best okay. uh, to try to get that for you. So I think uh, the last time that I saw many of you, I guess I should introduce myself, Kimberly Jessup. I serve as the state rep for Middlesex and East Montpelier, and I think I know a lot of you on the call. Um, and I think the last time that I saw many of you, we, it was around discussions of redistricting. Right. And as you may recall, the initial map that was put forth by the Legislative Apportionment Board had assigned parts of East Montpelier to two different districts and the East Montpelier BCA and special thanks to Edie Miller. And I spoke out strongly against that plan. And I'm happy to report that the House Government Operations Committee has produced a map that respects existing political subdivisions, communities of interest, while keeping within those reasonable population uh, deviations. And so that's a long way of saying that I, the Mount, East Mount Pillar is included in its entirety in the Washington Five District. And where that stands is um, the, the map is essentially finished or very nearly finished. And now what happens is legislative council can then start to begin to draft the reapportionment bill. And that has all sorts of language that puts into words descriptions of these new districts. So um, that's good news. And thanks to all of you who engaged, it really um, does make a difference because they heard from a lot of folks and uh, it, that's really important. Um, the, the two higher profile actions um, that probably everyone has heard about, of course, are there are two propositions to amend the Vermont Constitution. The first one, Proposition 2 or Prop 2, clarifies language in the anti-slavery clause of the Vermont Constitution. And as we all know, although Vermont was the first state to ban slavery and indentured servitude, it did not prohibit those practices for individuals under the age of 21. So Proposition 2 would amend Article 1 of the Constitution, and it would provide that, and I'm quoting, slavery and indentured servitude in any form are prohibited. And then the other uh, proposition that will be up is Proposition 5. And this is known as the Reproductive Liberty Amendment. And this essentially uh, would seek to enshrine practices um, that are really already happening in case law and elsewhere into the constitution. And uh, it's written, uh, I've had, had a number of questions about why it's written in the broad language that it is. And effectively uh, the answer is that um, it, it would provide liberty in all forms. So that would be the freedom to become pregnant, the, fee the freedom to seek sterilization. It can be, it was purposefully written and with, those sorts of very broad parameters in mind. And so both Proposition 2 and Proposition 5 will come up in November of 22, and it will be the voters of Vermont who decide whether this is the way to proceed or not. So uh, that, that has been an effort that's gotten a fair amount of news of use. The one thing I think I'm gonna to flip to right now, and I have all sorts of bills, but again, mindful of your time and trying to think about what would be most interesting there is a bill, um, it just came to the Appropriations Committee, it's called H518, you may have heard of it, it's the Municipal Energy Resilience Program, and, and it makes me think about what you were just saying about how to get municipal input for use of ARPA funds, because this bill has that, interestingly enough, uh, a pot of money designed for exactly that purpose. And what it, the upshot is that it is, it seeks to, uh, support communities with technical assistance, design support and funding to make municipal buildings, 
more efficient and at the same time to be decarbonizing the fuels they use and that comports with the climate action plan. So the way the bill is written, there's about $48 million uh, and it's in ARPA from the ARPA Capital Fund. 2.4 million of that would go to the regional planning commissions. And then there is 5 million in there for assist, uh, assessments by contractors. And then interestingly, there's the 1 million that I just mentioned for community outreach. And I'm guessing that that will look different across Vermont in every community. And then the remaining 40 million, give or take, is in the form of grants. And there's weatherization, thermal efficiency. I mean, all of those parameters will be uh, better defined, but that the cap on that is two hundred thousand uh, for each covered municipality. So this is just coming out of the house. It hasn't yet even made it to the house floor. We don't know, you know, how the Senate will receive it, but uh, that is something just to kind of keep on your radar that that will be coming out. Um, one other bill that um, might be of interest to you. This is uh, H697, and this gets to current use. This just came off the House floor this week. It was voted 83 to 43, it passed. And what it does is it adds the category of reserve forests to the current use program. And this is, uh, as I understand it, uh, reserve forest land is land that's managed for the purpose of attaining old forest values and functions. And that will, you know, no doubt be better defined in rulemaking with uh, the Department of uh, Forest Parks and Rec or the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And the goal is um, apparently there's a, something called the Vermont Conservation Design, which is on the Forest Parks and Rec uh, website as well as on the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And that calls for 9% of Vermont's forest land to return to old growth forests. And we currently have less than 1% of our forested landscape in old growth condition. And so I think the bill acknowledges the fact that maybe 40 years ago when current use was being put together, there wasn't as much concentration on forest sequestration or you know, biodiversity and perhaps more on retaining forest blocks, although obviously that's related, as well as you know, management of these blocks for forest products. So um, that is something that uh, will now go to the Senate and they may um, you know, change it substantially or not, I don't know. Um, but that's just another one um, that is that is coming down the pike. Um, one last thing that I'd say is um, this is just something I find personally interesting. There is a bill that we heard about recently. Um, I like to think of it a little bit as a silver lining of the pandemic, which relates to telemedicine. As we know, there were um, a lot of changes in how we access healthcare in the pandemic, and one of those that worked for many communities was to allow for telehealth. And the bill that just came through our committee, it's H655. And what it does is it creates a regulatory system that would allow out-of-state healthcare professionals to become licensed or registered to deliver services to Vermont residents using telehealth. And I just um, think that is kind of a neat thing because as many uh, tell us and all the time, it's very difficult. There are long waiting times. And then there's all sorts of specialized services that are just frankly difficult to find. Or you may have, um, let's take the population of college students who are in Vermont and maybe they're looking for a more specialized service that is difficult to find in a rural area. So um, that I just find heartening as um, you know, a practice, kind of like remote working that has uh, emerged from this pandemic that uh, we can take forward and use perhaps in different ways in the future. So I will stop talking there, but those are just a few of many things. Um, you know, you were talking about money. There, there are still the committee of conference for fiscal year 22, which I'm sitting on, um, was held over town meeting week. Uh, there were some disagreements about some amendments that were put on. And so we'll take that up when we get back and then we'll pivot to fiscal year 23. So it's a, it's a busy time. 
Okay, we like to have questions of Kimberly. If anybody's got some, we got we still have five minutes before the town forum starts. So sounds like you've been very busy, Kimberly. There's a lot going on. Yeah, you know, it's it's been interesting, Seth, trying to just see all these different pots of incoming federal funds and, and to your conversation earlier what are the parameters that work for what and 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 how do they overlap in the way that we've been doing it in appropriations we have um for lack of a better term a swap process that we do so we basically we we have funds we're waiting for treasury guidance we'll say we're going to spend this much money on this and then if the rules change because they're always evolving or they're special cases and then we take the money that we slotted in here we swap it out and we fill it and we move pots of money around this time. And a, and a, a pretty good example of that, I think, is um, around clean water. We know, for example, we have the IIJA, the, uh, um, the infrastructure bill that's coming. ARPA has a lot of clean water funding as well. And that's something I've been in conversation with some of you and trying to get some stuff jump started in terms of the village. Um, so we may slot in some money for ARPA and find out that this is something that could be done with the IIJA. So this whole process of how one moves around the different funding streams, which is all, what all of us do in our own family budgets, right? Um, but has been um, pretty eye-opening. And, um, and I think we've seen even at the federal level how um, you know, we think something might happen and then it doesn't or it comes out in a different form and... Uh, so yeah. it's it's kind of an exciting time that I think I think will leave Vermont a lot better off. I mean, one last example, since I don't see hands up, I'll just keep chattering, but feel free to interrupt, please. Um, you know, housing, we are putting so much money into housing and it is my hope and and I'm pretty optimistic about it that uh, Vermont's landscape with housing will look different and we won't have the same pressures that we do now. And hopefully it's done in a way um, that is uh, respectful of community patterns and zoning and all of the above. Yeah, so, so basically yeah. it's what you're in the position is to try to allocate the money wisely. So it has a long-term positive effect for Vermont. Right. So if you need any guidance on that, just call me anytime. <laughs> have a strong yeah. agricultural bent. <laughs> so. Yeah, in the in the committee conference, there is um, a piece that has to do with agriculture. It has to do with the difference in feed, I believe, making that up. Um, yeah. It's, I think, 2.6 million. Yeah, well, that would work. Um, yeah. Does anybody else have anything to ask of um, Kimberly? Because she's a font of information. Um, and she likes to talk. Um, <laughs> 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 Jenny, Jenny's got a hand up. Yeah, I, I am so excited about this change to current use. Um, I, I did have to move recently from my 70 some acres over on um, Horn of the Moon, but it was it was basically it was a, a joke. You had to just like cut some firewood or do this, that or the other thing, but it wasn't really um, aimed at um, generating good forest. It was aimed at doing complying with the law in order to get a tax break. And um, so we, we tried to do both. Um, and we had a really wonderful couple of foresters who worked with us. But I think taking a look at it and, and this new lens that you're using to look at qualifications for current use is long overdue. And I celebrate it. It's not my, it's not my land anymore, but boy, I love the program. Yeah, I do too. But I think that yeah. what they're talking about is um, trying to promote a different aspect of the forest. Is that correct? Uh, promoting right. more old, old, old stand wood forest trees. Maybe, maybe doing something about all the dead beech trees and that sort of thing while you're doing it. But yeah, I mean, basically, it was when we were first in it, it was cut down everything and send it to the pulp mill and lose money. Uh, so that. It, this is great. Thank you. Yeah, great. No, I, I'm, it, it, and it will no doubt evolve further. This is just getting going, but um, yeah, I, for the same reasons you're happy about it, Jenny, so am I. 
Mm-hmm. So, um, Kimberly, are you giving? Well, you're not giving a report at town meeting because we're not doing it in person. So this is right. kind of, this is your forum right now. This is it, and you know, I do hear from a lot of folks, and and um, people have different interests, and and that's really useful to me. Um, I put things out on front porch form occasionally, but I also, you know, try to be mindful of the fact that it's really a community bulletin board and I don't want to fill it up with, you know, all sorts of information that um, is reported elsewhere. So, you know, it's, it's a balance and, and, um, but I'm always happy to try to run down stuff or, or direct you to others who, who may know the data more than I do or the policy issue more than I do. So, I so kind of wish I was there, though, to see everyone. I like hanging out in that room. I know. So one last comment before we move to town form. What's the best way to call or email you, uh, Kimberly, or what? Yeah, email's good. Um, and um, that way I have a written record so that sometimes there's just a lot of incoming phone calls. And um, that way I could go back and say, now, what was that again? And it's clear to me who cared about what. And okay. it's also helpful because sometimes I start to see a pattern then, you know, okay, I'm, I'm hearing from nine people over here yeah. about this and yeah. it just, that's useful too. That's good. Okay. So email Kimberly if you've got questions um, or comments and that sounds good. And I want to thank you for coming into our, into our meeting to discuss everything that's going on. I want to thank you also for all your hard work because I know it's a lot of work. Yeah. Well, thank you all. Good to see all of your faces. All right. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Good night. Um, so that's that. And now we got to call the meeting to order for the town forum or call the town forum to order. So do we have any, it's um, 7.30. I'm going to call the meeting to order the town forum. Um, do we have any additions to the agenda for the Town form. I don't see any. I don't hear any. Um, public comment. We've got lots of public. So let's move on to B. Review of and discussion of 2022 town meeting articles. I see a lot of people are tuned in. Um, and I think we'll start right in with Article 2, which is FY 2022-2023 budget. Um, do we have any comment or questions on that? All is quiet on the Western Front. Um, Article three is the one about the property tax protocol. We have any questions on that? We do not. Article four is changing the constable to appointed position. Uh, Okay, I don't see any questions on that. The next one, Article 5, use of capital reserve fund for East Montpelier Fire Department engine purchase. No questions on that? Oh, I see a hand up. Michael Duane. Hi, Seth. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, it's not specifically with regard to the fire engine purchase, but um, I, I'm concerned that our select board has chosen not to put the uh, the operating budget of the fire department and the ambulance uh, department uh, up for a vote as a separate article or separate articles for the taxpayers to vote on. Uh, the uh, town of Callis has put those two items on its town meeting warning for the people to vote on. And I just think that we ought to be able to vote on those budgets. Um, it's their, their private nonprofit organizations that provide a very valuable service, similar to the Kellogg Hubbard Library and some of the other worthy organizations. And we just ought to have the right to vote on it. And if it's a worthy budget, it should pass, but we should be able to vote on it. And you're taking away the right of the taxpayers to vote on their tax dollar uh, appropriations. So um, I'm just putting my two cents into that. And I, Callis did it. There's no reason why East Montpelier can't do it. Okay. So I just, I just want to um, thank you, Michael, for that. But I just want to say one thing about that is we do vote on it. It's just in the budget for the whole town. It's, it's 
it's in the budget, but not as a separate item to vote on separately. I just want I, to- I, I understand that and that's, yes. No, no, I know you do, but I don't know if everyone else does. Yeah, I mean, we vote on it and, um, right. but, but you know, separate. You could, we could do the same thing with the Cullig Hubber Library and put that into the town budget and vote on that as part of the town budget. So we, we really ought to be voting on it. Okay. So that's, and if it's that's a worthy, and if it's, if it's a worthy budget, and I'm sure it is, if it's a worthy budget, it should right. pass, but the people should have a right to vote on it. Hold on separately because they are yes, voting yes. on it with the town budget. Right. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we, 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 we could lump everything into one and have right. one vote, you know? Right. Understood. Does anybody want to respond on the select board to Michael Dwayne's um, concern? I see Gene has got a hand up. Gene Troy? Yeah. I, I, I mean, I always thought that, that the fire department and emergency services had their own capital budget um, that we funded. And I agree with Michael that as voters, we should be able to vote on these budgets independently um, and not have to have them lumped into the entire town budget. Yeah. Okay, so that's um, good to know. And as we move forward next year with the budget process, we'll definitely keep that in mind. Yeah, we've got people that are concerned that would like to keep that out of the town budget and as a separate item to be voted on. Thank so you. We have discussed that back and forth. We've never um, separated it, but Ed Deegan? Yeah, thank you. I think they should be totally separate budget items that people right. get to decide on. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with either uh, um, of those opinions, but is there a legal aspect of this, Bruce, that, uh, how this works? Uh, is there any legal implications of, of, of the structure? It's a separate entity, nonprofit, so I think we should be able to do uh, a separate we used to We used to do it that way years ago. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I remember doing it that way yeah. years ago. Yeah. So I, you do have a tricky little problem. Okay, and that's it, what I It's thought. been true for years. Yeah. Uh, you have the limit of 25,000 on floor votes. So you're talking about something that has to be passed by Australian ballot. Right. And it has to be passed. <laughs> and so when you put it up for exposure as a separate article, you're basically exposing something that you can't afford to have turned down. Uh you know, is that a reason not to do it? Maybe not, because the same thing is true for the overall select board budget. Yeah. But bottom line, it it is a level of discomfort that uh, could cause trouble. Because we have a contract with the fire department, and it doesn't. It, it, I don't think it, it says in there that it's all right if you don't pass the budget. <laughs> you don't no, have to pay us. It says we're obligated to a certain percentage and a certain amount. So, um, uh, 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 John, John, let me just chime in on that, if I may, and thank you. Um, I used to, back in my uh, career, I used to write million dollar budgets, excuse me, contracts with agencies, um, private nonprofit organizations for the state of Vermont. And in every single one of those contracts throughout state government it always says, and this contract is contingent upon an appropriation by the legislature uh, of the state of Vermont at the end of the session. So th th yeah. that, that's just normal. That, 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 that's nothing extraordinary. Right. And, and, and people would sign these multi-million dollar budgets, uh, contracts, excuse me, then they had employees, but it was all contingent upon the legislature uh, appropriating sufficient funds because otherwise you're holding the government uh, with a small g hostage and, and you, you just can't operate that way so right. yeah yes it, it it it's important it's very important it might even be a little life and death some people might say the same thing about a library but um in terms of our society but we ought to be able to vote on it so thank you okay well we'll definitely discuss that michael before we um at the time when we put the warning together so great thanks seth yep yeah. so thank you does anybody else have anything to say on that before we move to the um, 
Kellogg Hubbard Library? Seth? Yes. Seth, could I, could, could you indulge me for one, one second to go sure. backwards one? I walked out of the room when you did article four. I was just curious why you decided uh, that you'd like to uh, appoint the constable. Um, well, we've had issues with this position and a problem with it. And it, it brought forth the fact that sometimes if there's a problem with an individual in a position, we are powerless to act on that if it's elected. So this is why um, we're requesting the voters approval to make this appointed. Um, it can be sensitive um, when you have individuals um, elected to a position and you, then you are powerless to affect their behavior. So this is why it would be appointed. Then if there's a problem, you could um, act appropriately. And it's very hard to do that when this position is elected. Okay. Could I um, ask a general question based on that response? Yep. Uh, the, I read in the, I was reading the free press this morning about, um, I think it's in Essex, a select, no, Underhill, a select board member in Underhill was recalled um, uh, just last year or something, and now he's running again. So the article was about, here's this guy who was recalled. Well, and well, how they did that, because in the past, we have dealt with this issue of an elected person somehow going off the rails. Yeah. Um, uh, but what Underhill did was they amended their charter to allow for the recall of an elected person. Yeah. Um, and, and that might be something I, uh, separate from the constable thing. I'm not making right. that contingent, but that might be something that we might want to think about for our charter. Okay. Well, that's interesting, Edie, and I'm glad you brought that up because that's another tool is what you're saying. That, that's exactly what I'm saying. Right. Yeah, it's just a tool. Right. It allows the people, and it is, um, I've forgotten whether it was by vote or by petition. It was by vote, yeah. It had to be petitioned and so forth like that. But it allowed that to happen, whereas right, right. now it doesn't. Unless you have that in your charter, you cannot, right. uh, you got to wait till the next election. And that's hard to do. Okay, Carl, you've got your hand up. Yeah, uh, thank you for bringing up the recall idea, Edie. I just want to remind you that the charter recall, at least in the first go round of uh, setting up the charter to begin with, when we were doing blue sky thinking of how do we want to change our local government to be able to do things that the state doesn't empower us to do that would be beneficial for the town. And the thinking of the committee at the time was to uh, not move forward on the recall because uh, they thought that that would lead to uh, really messy personal public conversations of the sort, uh, you know, the sort of personnel uh, conversations that are best handled behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. so, uh, so for that reason, you know, it, it seemed reasonable to me, given issues that we've had with uh, Constable in, in the past, uh, that it would be much simpler and, and face saving for everybody to be able to handle that as a personnel matter and uh, and take care of that without air airing dirty laundry in public, getting yeah, those. I was, I was not linking the notion of a recall to the constable position at all. It just made me, I just read that article this morning. And I think it is a tool uh, because we're not gonna, you know, all our positions, we're not gonna make them appointed. I don't think we've made a lot of them appointed and I think it makes a lot of sense. But I, okay. I'd like to revisit it. I mean, I was on yep. that charter committee too. Yeah, you chaired it. Uh, yes, and, and maybe it's time to get the band back together and talk about this and other things. But if, if I could, if I could just frame this question, Seth, um, yeah. as as Yidi has mentioned, uh, we have made some other um, positions that were elected appointed positions. We started out with the treasurer position. That was a first uh, position that the charter committee uh, considered. And that was when our newly elected uh, at that time, Treasurer Don Welch uh, said, you know, you may want to uh, look at making this an appointed position. Uh, this is getting to be a pretty complicated job. 
And you may want to have the select board be able to reach out even across town boundaries and find somebody to put in it. And, um, you know, we had so much respect for Don and, and his point of view, and we considered it and said, yes, that, that, that probably should be an appointed position. And we set up an elaborate process to uh, vet the candidates for that position uh, involving a seven person committee. So it wasn't just a select board reaching out and, and, uh, and grabbing somebody and putting them in, in place. And, uh, and then uh, we, we looked at the town clerk and we said, there, there's just one person who holds that job and they are elected to a three year term. Uh, um, if they choose not to show up or are not able to show up, uh, they can uh, keep doing that job or uh, in name uh, and there's no recourse from uh, the town because as Seth said, it's another elected official. So it seems wise on the second go around, I believe it was of the charter committee, it seems wise to make that an, an appointed position as well. Uh, there, there has been some talk, which I amongst other select board members have opposed of making the listers and the auditors um, appointed positions as well. Uh, we also have the option of making the planning commission appointed positions. I think it's really good to have uh, people have the opportunity to serve in elected positions in town. I think local democracy is really important. And in all of those cases, we have uh, a group of people, you know, three or nine people working together. So um, that way you have checks and balances internally within the groups. And, and I would like to see those continue as elected positions. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I see Nona, is that Nona? Yes, it is Nona. Like um, okay. it, it's part Charles, part Nona. Um, yeah. This is, the, I, I feel like this is a much more Im, important um, conversation maybe than some of us, including myself may realize. And uh, we have, for the 40 years that I've been involved in town business, enjoyed a relatively amicable town where we've been able to get business done without too much um, kickback um, and find the people that are like-minded, uh, put together things and present to the town ideas that the town could vote on without rancor. We've been very fortunate to live in these times. But as you all know, things are getting much more um, divided in this country. And I think these very issues that we're talking about that have been relatively up, up and down in the last years are going to be more complicated. And so I just, I, I, I don't have an answer, but I think that we all need to be very sensitive to um, uh, these these kinds of issues, and, and maybe that's not at all what you have in mind in in dealing with this. But but I think it can get tricky, and I appreciate it being discussed in whatever depth is in is necessary. Thank you, Nora. Yeah. Um, does anybody else have anything to say about Article? Oh, Gene. So we're talking about Article Four, changing the constable to appointed position. I I, I think. <clears throat> In general, we want to be careful about concentrating power in appointed positions to the select board and taking that power away from the individual voters. Um, we've managed to run our town for a couple hundred years by electing all these people individually. Um, and, you know, maybe everyone doesn't agree, but everyone has a say. And I think we need to be careful about concentrating that power in one board. That's okay. what I have to say. Okay. Anybody else have anything to say about Article 4? Okay, I'm gonna move on to Article 6, since we did the fire department engine purchase, and I see Carolyn Brenner is here to talk about the Kellogg Harvard Library appropriation. So if you have any questions about that appropriation, Carolyn Brennan is here. She's executive director of Kellogg Harvard Library. So, question, 
Carolyn, nice to see you. Thank you for your patience. You've been here for a while. I'm not hearing much. I'm not seeing much. Did you have anything to say, Carolyn, besides answering questions? I mean, you gave, a, you gave a very thorough presentation to the select board when you came in. So I did. Uh, and our, I'll, I'll just say, I just barely put our spring newsletter up on our website and our annual report is still there too with all of the, the stats and information that I would give to the town. And our uh, annual report is in, in your town annual report. So I, I really just came to answer questions. Right, well, thank you for doing that. Of course. Yeah, um, so I don't see anything. So I'm gonna move on to the article seven. Thank Carolyn again. And like she said, the report's in our town report, so. Seth, quick question. Um, Carol, do you have any idea roughly how many people from East Montpelier use the library? Do you have a, a <laughs> guesstimate? Sure do. Um, we have 737 active patrons from East Montpelier. So that's uh, residents that have used the library in the last year. Uh, and they checked out 12,000, a little over 12,000 physical items last year, plus uh, digital use we can't track by town. That's pretty impressive, actually. Were you good, Scott? Okay. So I'm gonna move, like I said, to the Four Corners Schoolhouse Association Appropriation. Um, anybody have any questions on that? I don't see any. Okay, so the next one is East Montpelier signpost appropriation. I don't see any there. Article eight, article nine is East Montpelier Trails Incorporation and incorporated appropriation. Sorry about that. Hi, Seth. Um, as a relatively new person involved in Vermont local politics, can you please explain what happens if a majority no vote passes on any of these budget? Uh, amendments or articles then then they don't get it they don't get the money they're just not funded for the year that's right okay thank you yep thank you some of this stuff gets voted on the floor usually if it's under twenty five thousand. but because we are operating under covid rules and everything's australian ballot that's why everything's on australian ballot even the small ones um article 10 montpelier senior Activity Center Appropriation. Anybody any questions on that? Comments? No. Nope. Article 11, Center of Vermont Home Health and Hospice Appropriation. No questions. Um, Article 12, Rural Community. Beth, there's one question on that. Oh, there is? Sorry. I, I was muted, yeah. I 11, uh, no, 12 and 13. Can you, I keep reading them again and again to try to make clear to myself what the difference is between these two things. Could you explain it simply? RCT and Green Mountain Transfer. Carl, you want to get into that? I know it's two different uh, companies. Yeah, this is actually a, a different transportation question than the one that we usually get. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what the one we usually get is. Right. So um, Article 12 and Article 13 <clears throat> are both for the commuter bus along Route 2. Um, okay. And uh, as you said, Seth, it's two different companies that have split the cost of providing those services. So we're just uh, being asked to provide funding to each of those. But uh, you can consider them as, as one common article. If you like having the commuter bus along Route 2, then you should vote yes on both. If you don't like funding it, you should vote no on both. And I believe it's been level funding for quite a while. Or it has it been, yes. Well, it also comes up Town Hill Road. Don't forget yeah. that. It's not only on Route 2. That's, That's right. right. It come it comes from um, Montpelier and and uh, comes up town, County Road or lower, mm -hmm. Upper Main Street onto Town Hill Road. Absolutely. And they stop it. If you stand out on a corner, they'll stop and pick you up. And Anybody would stop and pick you up, Nona. <laughs> <laughs> At my age, I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> 
<laughs> and we like to support mass transportation, at least I do personally. But. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions on the transit? Nope. Okay. Um, Twin Valley Seniors Incorporated, Incorporated Appropriation. Anybody have any questions, comments about Twin Valley? I believe the executive director is on board here tonight, Gene Troya, to answer questions. I'm not seeing any. Okay, let's move to Article 15. Is the funding request study committee recommendation for appropriations to worthy organizations? We have a number of those. I think there's over 20. Um, I've got a sheet somewhere here with them, but where is uh questions on those what we do is we lump all these little appropriations together edie edie's got her hand up just a question of what something is it um we may have done it in past years i didn't go back and check the vermont bar foundation <laughs> what the heck is that and why you know it sounded like the vermont bar association and i wondered why we were funding things for the lawyers it's not the Vermont Bar Foundation. It's the Vermont um, Bar Foundation. The Vermont Bar Association is the Association for Vermont. I, I, I know what it is. Yeah. What's the, the Vermont, foundation? The Vermont Bar Foundation is an organization that the Vermont Bar Association funds along with other funding sources that provides legal represented to underserved populations. It provides um, grant programs and to legal aid. Um, and other um, have justice, will travel, and other programs that provide legal assistance to um, underserved communities and folks who can't afford a lawyer. So um, that's what the Vermont Bar Foundation is. It's separate and apart from the Vermont Bar Association, um, but it's not funding lawyers. It's funding programs that provide legal services to um, folks who can't afford a lawyer, um, immigrant populations, it provides uh, uh, landlord tenant um, legal assistance, a number of services uh, throughout the state, including places in Washington County. So, so is, is this, uh, Judith, is this um, integrated at all with the public defender or other, other public um, legal providing services? Um, among the, it provides grants to a number of existing organizations. Um, one of the uh, programs that it funds is a, um, a fellowship, uh, a poverty law fellow who can be sponsored or housed with Vermont Legal Aid or Vermont Law School. And the Vermont Bar Foundation provides the um, salary for that person for a two-year period of time. So that's one of um, the programs that it provides, but it also provides um, services to community action programs throughout the state. Um, so existing programs, it helps provide grants to those programs. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you for clarifying that, Judith. That was a good answer. Um, okay, anybody else have any questions on the uh, appropriations? The funding requests, there's 36 of them actually. An awful lot of them that have been vetted by the uh, funding request study committee. And we've got some members of that committee here. So if you've got any questions about a specific item here, we have qualified personnel to answer your questions on hand and ready. I know I was stretching a few things there. But, um, I don't see any questions. Okay. Yes. Yes. Since there uh, aren't any questions about any of those 36 uh, organizations on Article 15, I, I think this is a, a reasonable time just to point out a democracy aspect of the way we organize our votes, since that's come up a number of times in uh, today's forum. Um, years ago, East Montpelier voted to have all articles over $25,000 
which I don't know what it would be inflation adjusted now, but um, be a lot more than $25,000 in today's money, uh, have all of those be voted on uh, by Australian ballot and appropriations of less than $25,000 would be voted on on the town floor. And what that has meant is that when we get something like Article 15 in an ordinary year, when we are meeting in person, then we have the opportunity to discuss each of those uh, and to amend the amounts if we want. Um, whereas everything else, like Keller Hubbard Library, Montpelier Senior Activity Center Appropriation, CVH, HH, uh, et cetera, uh, those are always on Australian ballots, even in non COVID years. And we don't have the amendment. Uh, Bruce is, um, you're right. Some, uh, you're yeah. right. Most of those are, are the, under the 25,000. Thank you. Um, but uh, things like the Keller Hubbard Library appropriation uh, is always on Australian ballot because that's over the 25,000. And what, what we find ourselves doing uh, to operate within the rules the town has given us is uh, breaking out um, the organizations from this article, what's Article 15 this year, and putting them on uh, either the separate articles for voting on at town meeting or um, bumping it up to something that's voted on by Australian ballot. And um, I, I don't have a point to make about what to do one way or other here. I just want folks to understand the dynamic that's at, at work here, uh, how we are working in response to what the town decades ago told us uh, that they wanted to do. Is it is it a great thing? Is it, is it uh, a not so great thing? I don't have a strong opinion on that, but uh, we've got a lot of people here who, who've thought a lot over the years about uh, how to run the town. And I wanted to bring that to, to uh, the front of the discussion. Okay. Seth? Don? Yes? I just wanted to put a little history in here because those of you who were around when the, I was one of the movers that grouped these because we used to spend long times on each one of these items. It might even be an hour on a $500 item or a $100 item. <clears throat> and so this was one way to, to, shorten the meetings because you can deal with a you know a local thing and a hundred dollar thing you can say okay i want 125 but i'd rather have 130 and you vote you do all that and it just eats up a lot of time for very little money uh and this allow going with a grouping and keeping it under the 25 thousand does just I mean, because you can break that, you can break that uh, in a town on the floor, you can break that down and, and isolate one and increase it or decrease it or whatever, uh, as may be voted. Uh, so it, it's still there, the, the, the uh, town meeting effect is still there, but it's, it's so uh, shortened a lot because we get the funding request committee that has already vetted these. I think that's the that's an important point too, Don. That in addition to um, the saving of time, or even more important than the saving of time, is the fact that the committee actually pays. You know, rather than just discuss things on the day of the meeting, the committee has looked at this. And vetted it, and vetted these requests, and asked the right questions, and that's what we count on. And if I could just add to that, um, a little, a little extra history. We started out with ten thousand um, dollars. You are not in, in Vermont, are you? No, I'm not in Vermont. <laughs> <Just> far away. <laughs> we miss you, Rachel. I miss <laughs> Vermont. I hate missing a good snowstorm. <laughs> but Sorry, anyway, I didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> that's okay. That's all I really wanted to add to it is when the committee first started, I was actually on the very first funding committee years ago. Um, and we started out with a $10,000 limit. And at some point, I don't even remember when or how it happened. It was um, raised to $25,000. I think it was because we were getting more and more requests and inflation and whatever. 
Yeah. Uh, so. Okay. Uh, yeah. Th th thank, thank you for that that history, all, all of you. And um, I just want to point out that um, for these articles that are broken out of that, what's this year, Article 15, uh, then those are not um, un, unsupervised added to the, the ballot, but the select board itself provides that um, due diligence work that the funding request study committee does. And you for can the raise others. your hand too. Wait, wait, wait. Okay. Oh, um, Paul, you get your hand up? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> I wonder what my father would think of this. <laughs> I think, you know, we've spent decades making town meeting less a matter of our doing our own town business and <clears throat> more, I suppose it facilitates the ease of operations, but it seems to me that it's, you know, we basically pretty well caused our town meeting to be not worth going to except for the lunch and I I kind of feel bad about <laughs> uh, continuing to make town meeting irrelevant which is basically what we've been doing so anyway thank you Anybody else have anything to say on the, um, do I see? Okay. Nona. Nona, I think. I, I was just gonna comment on that. There's some truth to it, but golly, it's nice to see you all even this way. And I really miss our getting together. Can't we do it next year? I mean, in person. We hope so. <laughs> yeah. I miss it a lot. So, uh, you know, in, in due respect to your dear father, um, uh, I, I really do enjoy uh, our, our town meetings, however they take place, especially when we're together. Okay. We've gotten a lot of feedback on people's uh, thoughts on that funding request committee. Um, so I'd like to move on to the, as a business, um, we see a lot of people still tuned in here. Were there other concerns that people had that they want to bring up since we're, we have a number of people that are tuned in here. Were they tuning in because they want to say things? This is, uh, this is your chance to comment, ask questions about um, things that are on the town warning, et cetera, et cetera. So we all have a town, I don't know if you all have a town report, I've got one, but mm -hmm. if people have been reading that and you have questions, we'd love to answer them. Yes? Michael Duane, are you waving at me? Or are you? I'm, wave, I'm waving at you, Seth. Uh, uh, compliments to the select board on a well put together town report. Um, although, you know, the binding is really loose on my report. It is? Oh, that's and, right. You're right. And, 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 and the pages seem loose. You read it too much, Michael. Yeah, Mike, uh, yes, there you go, John. Yeah, you, see it. I, you overused I was flipping. it. <laughs> I overused it. But. Um, it, 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 it seems a little. Open. It seems a little flimsy. I got to put some, uh, you know, some uh, glue in there. But uh, but anyways, a very nice town report. Thanks to the select board. It's very well put put out. Just uh, just check with the printer about the binding mixture. Okay, so Deb Fillion is the one who puts it together. Yeah. Does an awesome job. And the other thing I want to say about the binding: hey, not to open. You're not supposed to use it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Okay. Thank you. It only has to last a year. That's right. And you and you made it's made to look nice when it's on the coffee table. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay. Just, just and just to clarify, Deb Fillion is an elected auditor put together the town report. Excellent Thank job. You. Excellent job. Fantastic. We'll pass that on. Always good job, Deb. Does anybody else have any um, comments, complaints, questions, etc.? Yeah, Ed. I uh, just want to also say thank you to all the boards, uh, the select board and all. It's been an interesting couple of years that we've all <laughs> survived through. And, uh, you know, I, I think the town has survived and come out because of who we are as a, as a group. And uh, select board, I really appreciate everybody, uh, fire department, uh, 
I'm one of the auditors. Deb does an absolutely great job. You look at other town reports, I think it's one of the best ones that are out there. Uh, Bruce, I can't thank you enough for everything that you do. And Don, Don um, has done just a fantastic job. But all the committees, everybody who has uh, reached out and served for the community, my personal thanks to all of you. Well, thank you, Ed. Um, of course, everyone knows that Don is going to be retiring soon. So that's going to be sad. Um, I want to thank Don for all his years of service. Um, and he served on many different capacities for the town. Mm -hmm. And he's mm -hmm. been a fantastic resource for us all. And uh, I hate to see him, Don retire. Um, so I want to express our appreciation to Don and wish him lots of luck in playing, mm -hmm. etc. So, mm -hmm. so you have our appreciation, Don. Uh, thank you very good. much, everybody. I've enjoyed doing it. Well. Thanks again, because you've been a great resource. Um, and a great I'm not person leaving person. either. It's been a lot of fun to work with you. Uh, anything else? Because we can, we can close the hearing, because uh, it looks like we're at that point. So, okay, we have a thumbs up. I'm gonna close the town forum. And Thank you. Thanks everyone Thank for coming. You. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And do we need a motion to adjourn? Kind of looks like we do. I'll make a motion we adjourn the hearing. Do we have a second on that? Second. Second. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Everybody's going to say aye and bye. Aye, bye. Aye. Bye. <laughs> bye. <laughs>